wow, these people of God. Oh, who's ah! <laughs> hey, Owen, how are you? Hi. Hey, and Jeff. Jeff. Si Jeff sideways. Wait, Jeff, no, this way. Side there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, wait, no, we're just going to do it. We're all going to do that. <laughs> mm. I said, yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Good. Great see to see you. We're going to call this series uh, the Music in the Morning Watch Party. Adrian. Fabulous. I have to say, Adrian, this has been a very special evening because tomorrow is my 87th birthday. Woohoo! Yay. Like that. Wow. <laughs> Happy birthday, June. Happy I'm birthday. still here. <laughs> <laughs> That's just great. And you're a, you're a tech wizard, June. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. <laughs> you guys have always been the, like, one of the most busy musicians on the planet. And what I think is so inspiring is looking at you now and you're still just as busy in this digital space. Is that is that this last thing was this a SLSQ production? Is this No, that was that was sort of a side a side project I have going up here in San Francisco called No E Music. Um but the the quartet has been featured and you know my work with the quartet is like, you know, front and center my my sort of calling card with with the it's a chamber music concert right answer that, oh sorry you no know, that we're trying to <laughs> we're just trying to make lemonade you know here and um but no that's that's a sort of side hobby thing that i have is that noe valley chamber music society They've oh formerly right. known as yeah okay we used to play yeah. that's a great, great wild yeah that's right i remember it i remember yeah, seeing right afira here. on the on the the list yeah yeah i heard those yep. guys there. so you know, I uh, because we're going to see this. Um, thanks to you and the uh, the quartet. What what is it about Haydn? Can I ask you what it is? What miracle of, that he did in his composing that you love so much? I mean, you know, more than other more than other composers, Jeff, or is he the top guy? Oh, top guy for sure. There's nobody even That's close. Awesome. It's yeah. It's it's. I mean, for quartets, it doesn't. You know. There's different and and but there's not better. Shall so, we say is that? there anything you can let like our audience know why you personally really like it? I mean, what what is it that grabs you? Well, man, it's a it's a it's a very long answer, and we oh, I, yeah. and all four of us would have different answers to the same question. But I think we all share the the passion for. It. I mean, it's um, it's endlessly inventive. It's effortlessly inventive. There's no. There's no struggle, but it also delves into the basics of human emotion in a way that um, is so natural. It's just it 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 basically sums up Haydn quartet sum up why music is so powerful, why it's so great, why it's why it's um, um, so so easily affects so many people, even though they don't think it will, you know. And it, and that's what what makes music so great, right? There's it's the universal language. That great story about you know Haydn. Going to London, he's going to London. Mozart was like, "Oh, I don't know what he called him, Joe. Probably not Joe." But Mozart said, "Haydn, you can't go. With, you're gonna, you're gonna be a fish out of water. London's crazy, and it's everything. You don't speak the language, and it's, it's gonna be terrible." He was so worried for him, and Haydn said, "No, no, my, my language is spoken everywhere." And he, I mean, he was totally right. He lo like, London loved him, and he loved London. So the the, the Haydn quartets, especially, are. Um, it just, it's an incredible uh, wealth of uh, constant discovery and inspiration and perfect balance between brain and emotion and orchestration and using the instruments in ways which are so perfect and so effortless. And I, it's, uh, it, it's hard to, I mean, it, I don't know, I'm not doing it very well, but it, it's, uh, it doesn't get a whole lot better. And the problem is there are like 68 of them. I mean, 50 so... Uh, I mean, 50 of them say, I don't know, something like that are masterpieces. And you get to the Opus 76 set uh, of which you'll hear 76.5. I mean, he came back from London, a rock, total rock star, like world famous. And he wrote these just because he wanted to. He wasn't, you know, he didn't need the money. He didn't, he just thought the quartet was this special thing, this way to express himself that he wanted to, 
to keep doing. And so it's really, it's an amazingly beautiful moment in the history of music. It was 1790s Haydn writing quartet. So when he wrote Opus 76, was he actually writing for professionals, the virtuosos? Like I know in the early quartets, wasn't he writing for friends and, and music lovers? Well, the first concerts? Before Esterhazy, supposedly the quartet sort of evolved very gradually from, mm -hmm. hey, Haydn, I, there's a party and we need some music outside, you know, it's a thing. And, and then we have a, we have two violins, a viola and a cello, you know, it was one of those sort of, you know, it sort of happened. But mm -hmm. from Esterhazy on, he had the pick of the crop, the pick of the litter, so to speak. So he had these incredible players. And I'm sure he was just writing for fun because as, as far as I can tell, Esterhazy was not commissioning and not asking him to write quartets. He said, I don't want to, he would ask for everything. You know, I, want, I need an opera a week. I need a new symphony this week. I need six baritone trios. Yes. But he was not demanding quartets. So I think from early on, Haydn was doing it because he just, he found it and he, and he loved it. And he thought this was a, a way that I can really experiment. And, and, and if you look at, I mean, this is getting super geeky. If you have a lot of time and you want to listen to a lot of symphonies and quartets and juxtaposition on each other, you know, the symphonies are amazing and inventive in their own ways, but they don't experiment and they don't go to such deep emotional places uh, like the quartets. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm sort of biased, I suppose, but. Um, that is there a bias? Is that a, a bias that goes across the entire St. Lawrence Quartet? Are you equally fanatical about Haydn, the other three of you? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you know, the the violin parts have a kind of like um, special sort of um, protagonist role, I think, for the most part. Like if we're going to make a gross generalization, which isn't really true or fair, but if you are, I would say that like there's um, there's a a role for the the violin, you know, first violin primarily, but I've played plenty of first violin Haydn quartets in my life too, that, um, that, you know, you tell a kind of hero's quest with, with that, um, that voice. And that's not to say that it doesn't also exist in, in, you know, the pure democracy of, of the voices. And of course he invented that, um, is, is, so I guess I'm posing the question is, um, are Haydn quartets especially interesting to violinists? I don't know. I, I, I don't feel equipped to answer that as a violinist. I would say that uh, my, what's the word I would use? Uh, the way these re this body of work resonates with me has just steadily grown as I've also grown. <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't bottom out, you know? So mm -hmm. play, we play, we might play two, two or three or four Haydn quartets kind of on a loop for 12, 15 months. And it, it, they just don't, you never sense that they're getting any cobwebs. They just remain constantly, you can just constantly just tease at new, new jewels or Easter eggs, as we say, almost on a daily basis. And um, I was thinking the other day, it's a little bit like when you, uh, you know, if you're lucky and you're, and when you're a child and you have a wonderful mother and then you're like, yeah, yeah, she was great. And then you, you become a, an adult and then you have your own children. You're like, wow, my mom was really amazing. Sort of like that. <laughs> you realize, wow. Yeah, he really was incredible. So. You know, it, it's interesting because uh, uh, personal musical preferences change over time, it, it, and they'll just change. They they shift and maybe shift back, uh, depending on where you are in your life. Um, and in general, and I think it's it's always been the case for me. Um, I love Bach. I don't love other Baroque composers all that much, but I absolutely adore Bach. I kind of skip over all the classical composers, and then I love really crazy intense romantic music going into like really gnarly music um and i've always respected haydn uh, i think being in this quartet and playing a lot of haydn has made me develop a love for haydn i'm not naturally inclined to be drawn toward haydn uh i i, I mean i I'd be perfectly honest i don't seek out haydn when i listen to music and yet when we play the quartets i think they're great and I agree with Jeff that there, you know, nobody did better. Um, 
I think my own personal preferences take me in another direction. But but at the same time, uh, I'm not like, oh, damn, I got to play another Haydn Quartet. She's, you know, no, I love playing Haydn Quartets. I enjoy it as enjoy playing Haydn Quartets as much as anybody. I think my own musical preferences, though, would take me more toward, um, you know, Olivia Messian, for example. Um, and my quartet's sick of me talking about Messian, but I, I, I adore this sort of, you know, slightly sort of mystical uh, 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 challenging listening that comes from that or 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 even second viennese school when you get into berg and 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 then even before that you know strauss uh richard strauss and and, and such um I, i'm just more drawn to that I, I can't explain why i think i always have been and then skipping backward over the classical era and going to bach <laughs> you know, so it's kind of I, it's hard it's really kind of hard maybe i like more complicated stuff the more complicated the better um and believe me i love mozart I really truly do and i love early beethoven too so it, it's hard for me to, to generalize uh, regarding this but um it doesn't i think i, I may perhaps differ slightly from my colleagues in this regard but but it doesn't make me less enthusiastic about playing the music that's the fun part i think it's truly great and i'm happy to do it any day of the week but we should i should be clear here chris has never once said oh darn it i have to play their Haydn quartet mm. yeah, a lot of cellists yeah play I, yeah, like like vehemently against height. So Chris has been, um, even though it might not be his absolute desert island first choice, he's been a, a an active participant in this journey. Well, and it's it, it, and not because my arm's been twisted. I mean, I recognize no, all the great things that, that that Jeff was talking about for sure. I recognize it and 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 really appreciate it. So it, it, it's fun. I mean, I think, but I think you talk to any uh, uh, musician, they're going to. You know, have perspectives on things, and uh, it's only natural that, that that would be the case. You know, you know what I find, Adrian. I don't know how you you guys play a lot. I mean, the more Beethoven and Mozart I play in terms of string quartets, the more I realize how great Haydn is. You know, I, mm -hmm. and, I and I, as Chris said, I love both of those. I mean, there are moments mm -hmm. that are terrible, mm -hmm. but it makes me realize the laser focus and the the lack of dead air, so to speak, in Haydn. There are very few in the great quartets. And, you know, we're playing Beethoven. There's some great moments. And then there's some moments where like, you that didn't, you know, we, and Mozart's the same way. He was, um, I, you know, I love Mozart quartets. But the more you, you really get into those guys who were so influenced mm -hmm. by Haydn, the more you realize that they really wanted to be Haydn. And Haydn had, because I think also he had this incredible, I think one of the great challenges of composing, and I don't know because I never composed, but is 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 fig, looking at the bigger picture, like understanding how to pace yourself through a piece. How long should a phrase be? How many times should, should you repeat it? Where should you move the material from one instrument to the next? And, 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 I, and I think the craft, when we're talking about the craft, I mean, Haydn truly did it better than anybody else. I mean, it, it, it's in Beethoven. You could feel him. I agree. I, you, I love Beethoven. I truly do. But you hear a stumble every so often, where it's like yeah. you, you feel like he he was puzzling over what to do, yeah, and, and made a choice, right? And and, and and you feel like Haydn's like, oh no, of course it has to be this way, and of course it has to be this way, and that's uh, maybe in some ways that's what fascinates me most about Haydn. I think well, it's fair should... to say that when we are all sitting down and playing Haydn, we're all utterly convinced that this is the greatest music ever written mm. you know as we're playing it it's like he has that that way sort of sort of like for me handle is is the same way when i mm. listen to handle i'm like there's no greater music this is so amazing you know just that kind of overwhelm and um and 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 you know the sort of the craft as chris is mentioning the the heightened emotionalism the um the interplay the dialogue the camaraderie all of that coming together in sort of one organic, simple package, um, simple only in the sense that, you know, there's there's no there's no fat, as Jeff was saying. There's no um, there's nothing extraneous. It's it's just pure invention, and that is mm -hmm. always just so inspiring. So yes. I don't I don't think we we I think we would agree as a quartet that no composer does that better. I, I mean, look, right. like Lee, using this quartet, your uh, Opus 76 Five as an example, it's just like, what, 22 minutes? I mean, it's not long. You know, Haile mm -hmm. Gadok is on his 15 minutes, the Beethoven slow movement from 132. So in a, like, let's say 22 minute work, he goes, this first movement, he, he blows up what Sonata form is. And he has this weird, like super charming, lovely classical thing. And then the storm sequence, and then the surprise when it comes back. And so that's all, he blows that story up and then he goes to this crazy key and this incredibly emotional deeply felt like late beethoven vibe slow movement right i mean it's just mm -hmm. i mean it's one of the most deeply felt and romantic 
you know, emotional movements ever written. And right. you're like, what could happen next? And then he has this, you know, hilarious minuet with uh, messing with feet and the cello. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the minuet was his, his total show off. It mm-hmm. distilled in four minutes this, right. the, the, the vibe and the play with rhythm and interplay of two against three, et cetera. And then the final movement is like his whimsy and his ability to make you laugh in a way which is mm-hmm. so natural. And this Rondo finale, which is hilarious and effervescent and virtuosic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so within this, the shape mm-hmm. of the, the story of the four movements, mm-hmm. the effortlessness that he puts them together and the extreme on the contrast between the emotionalism and the charm and the gallantness of the first movement mm-hmm. and the dance and then the, the presto craziness and the fun of the finale. I mean, it sort of sums up, it's one of his great statements right. and he does it in like less than 25 it's minutes. It's very short. Yeah, surprisingly right? short. I mean, it's, if, it feels, it's, it, yeah, you think it has to be a 35 minute piece because there's so much that happens in yeah. it and then you time it and it's, it's 20 minutes long. It's you know, amazing. It's, a, it's, it's really, I, I mean, I, like you could take mm-hmm. the, uh, it's the famous mm-hmm. Beecham quote, you know, I love that mm-hmm. Sir Thomas Beecham. Um, mm-hmm. And this is not to diss on Bach, Chris. <laughs> no, I no, Bach. no, I please. I, I, I'm open-minded but to any He said, um, Beecham, and he was famous for being irreverent, and mm-hmm. he was often drunk. And, I mean, he was brilliant, <laughs> but he said, <laughs> I would trade <laughs> all of six Brandenburg concertos for that one moment in the introduction to Guno's Faust with the hot, <laughs> contrary motion. I mean, there's, it is an amazing moment, I'll be saying. Right, I right. love it. But he was, you know, he was saying, I'd trade that moment for all the six Brandenburg concertos because they're boring. (laughs) So, like, basically, you could say, you know, that slow movement, is there anything better than, I mean, is there anything more expressive than that? Would you trade that for anything? Does anybody express human emotion Mm -hmm. better than the slow movement of 76.5? Like, no, but perhaps not. And and, and one of the, yeah, and, and again, it shows, as you were just saying, this key. I mean, where did this key come from? Yeah, uh, it's, you know, it, 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 when you listen to the piece, you see it's like what you know, it, 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 and and also also really hard to play because it doesn't lie well on the instruments. But but um, I, I mean, there again it characterizes the, what's great about Hyde, the, the craft of, of Hyde, and you feel like it was you're just like oh, of course, boom, writes it down. Now I don't you know who, who who knows how he actually wrote music, but he must have been doing it pretty quickly to write the amount of music that he wrote. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and there was just a, you, I, I don't know. This is get me in trouble to say this, but 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 Haydn was this sort of natural craftsman. M- Mozart, we say often, was a natural melodist. He just whipped stuff off too, formed it in his head and did it. But there was something neater and cleaner about it. Haydn went for the rough edges sometimes, and went for the humor a lot of the time. Because we, I don't even know if we've addressed that yet. Uh, 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 I mean, you get to the last moment of this quartet, you know, with with the with the rests, with the with the the, the, the uh, uh, silences. And using silence as this this really humorous uh, uh, technique, you know, uh, and then Jeff talked about the the minuet, and and and, and it's true that no no one uh, you know, uh, you know, provided the charm and and variety and surprise uh, in minuets like Haydn did. So is that because it's so well crafted? Is that how it stays fresh? I mean, you guys sounded like you just play it without any effort and just picked the instruments up and played it and was just brand new and fresh. It stays that way. Is that because it's so well crafted that um, you have to work at all these parts or does it just come naturally to you? Hmm. I would say it, uh, it actually suffers from inattention. And perhaps that's why a lot of people don't feel that fond of these works. Um, I think they just like every great piece of art, you need to have that a great piece of anything you need to sink into it and to really um process what you see and feel before you but i think the it doesn't play itself I made mean, it could at a cocktail party and it works just fine like that is what we tend to say um but the real magic and um, um relevance of it is i love that you said that honestly like we we jeff kind of touched on this before when a, when a cellist in a quartet a young quartet is just kind of like well let's Let's play like like some of these big war horse pieces, right? Like, oh, it's boring, you know. And I think that what everybody's kind of getting at is that in the Haydn, when you know when we're talking about instruments and we're saying, oh, this instrument, I don't know what it is, but it gives back a lot, right? You you do something with an instrument and, and it responds and it does something. I feel like Haydn quartets, you you choose to do something, it can suck, 
Mm-hmm. And it could be amazing. So mm-hmm. it, it suffers from that inattention or it suffers from like just being bad, right? Yeah. Like the, especially when we're talking about that second movement, the, uh, June, they call the, the second movement the graveyard. Some people just make <laughs> so sharps and it just looks like a bunch of crosses. In a, oh, and because it, of the key signature. Gra- yeah. in, a good, in a good way, though. <laughs> yeah, not, not in any, any artistic sense. I mean, Leslie touched on it, but, you know, we could spend... Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we do. We spend many hours trying to get that in tune because F sharp mm-hmm. major is just oh, it's, brutal. F sharp major is tough. For those you non-string players, there's no open string. Like you can't use open strings as a foundation. So you're sort of in this netherland of F sharps and all sharps and no open strings. And it's totally mm-hmm. nasty for intonation. And it and we spend lots of hours and it's still out of tune. I mean there's <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. No, but, so, oh, it's hard. It's really you know, tough. like when it's, you guys work true. at something, it comes. It, it really com- seems to give back, right? And, and then there's certain quartets. Is this true that there's certain quartets that are really fun to play, and they, like you know, it's kind of like those concert halls where they're like, well, you sound really good on stage, but when you go into the hall, you have to work that much harder because you realize it's not that great of a hall. And there's some halls that sound really dry on stage, like Wigmore, but out in the hall it sounds really good like, to the audience mm-hmm. you know and, and then there's there's a bunch of people that think different things but then when there's like and i i, I don't want to say this too much because the brahms i love brahms i actually love brahms sextets the quintets and whatever but i felt the quartets i've never been able to get into mm-hmm. that the quartets you can work your butt off and actually it's usually when you ask at the end of a quartet rehearsal like, i love playing the i had such a good time playing the brahms and, and you ask anybody outside of the quartet maybe i'm just talking about my quartet anybody outside of the quartet that wasn't playing they're like yeah that was a slug you know those three quartets are, are particularly challenging on many levels uh, not to even get into you know whether we you know how much we like or dislike brahms but just talk about those three pieces because i you know i'm a, a fan of brahms too but i find those pieces hugely challenging on both ends to play and and to listen to and and i feel like it, i don't know it's it I, I, maybe i'm just really thinking about this tonight but you, you know, uh, uh, things that are created with sort of a, a, a natural sense and with ease. Uh, um, and that's not to say that pieces that are created out of struggle can't be, some of the greatest things ever were created out of huge struggle. We know this is true. Um, I mean, Schumann and and, and, and Beethoven come to mind. Um, but uh, again, I think what makes Haydn, and maybe we're wrong, maybe I'm totally wrong in saying this about Haydn, but you feel like the, the sense is that it just had a way of coming out of him. Just like, oh, boom. I, I know how to do this, and not in a way that was perfunctory, or uh, that's the thing that's great about it. It's that you know Haydn could could write this music and uh, uh, um, have it still be filled with wonder, and and and, and yet you feel like it, it just. It, it, it flowed from him naturally, with the Brahms quartets, and we know that he he burned twenty some odd quartets that he had all written in addition to the three that survive, and you feel like he just struggled like crazy to come up with these things, and. I always feel like when you play that, those pieces that he's tr- trying to create some kind of orchestral texture that that doesn't really um, c- come through successfully, very, at least easily. Uh, and and there, there's so many ch- challenges in the pieces. I mean, I think there have been obviously successful performances of them, but I think they're, they, they require, playing a Brahms quartet requires a lot of work. And I think, um, and I don't mean to, 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 to put it down. I just feel like it's a different kind of piece in the sense that, uh, I mean, look, uh, uh, you know, late Beethoven, you know, the poor guy was deaf and he's going through what he was going through and he wrote these pieces and, and, and there's a lot of struggle in that too. But somehow when it comes together, for, okay, for example, you listen to an orchestral version of Opus 131, like Bernstein like to do that. And, and various, I think Bernstein made his own arrangement of Opus 131. And I heard it on the radio recently. And I just, I, I, I hated it so much I had to keep listening to it because I was just like, not a whole orchestra no and the tempo is too slow because you know and and um and, and and you know there was so much effort into getting it in at the work i i feel like you, you know you play a late beethoven quartet you put the effort into it and there's something that kind of like uh there's, there's something so strangely mystical about it that, that you can't help but to be fascinated by it um uh, and and i think you know back to your question about the brahms quartets i think there's a lot of good stuff in it, but it's just hard to pull the larger forms off because I feel like he he worked awfully hard to try to get something to, to work. And I think he was just missing a by a little bit with, with exceptions, like I say. And, and we've played, you know, quite recently, the A minor quartet. Um, and I think we've enjoyed it by and large. But but I think there are, there are challenges there for sure that maybe you don't see in other other pieces. 
Adrian, should we talk about um, the audience and the lack of audience? When I saw the uh, video and the, and the house, the beautiful Bing Hall empty, and then you finished playing and you walked out, oh, I don't know, I just felt like crying that there was nobody there. How do each of you feel about this time uh, when there is no audience? Like, is, does it make a, a difference? I mean, how have you handled this uh, business with, um, I mean, I, you like to do a lot of things, uh, Owen, with um, uh, the, the digital. So well, maybe you could start. <laughs> sure, how okay. Do most, how do you emotionally <laughs> manage not playing? Um, not well, I I am I'm I'm worried about it uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it's kind of like a muscle that that atrophy. I mean, first of all, the audience is is crucial to that magic, that alchemy, that that incredible experience of being in a hall where the performers, the composer, the audience, they're in this like this this dialogue. You know that hair on the back of your neck standing up feeling that we all know i mean that is is um you know the audience plays as much of a role in that as as any of those those three legs of that stool so um so it, there's something really fundamentally wrong with this whole idea of playing to empty halls and videotaping them i i think that it's it's um Again, I said this before. It's a it's a poor substitute. It's what we've got. We're trying to make lemonade out of lemons yeah. here, but mm -hmm. but um, but I I think that we've been just holding on to the memory of live performance for audience and and just trusting and and hoping that we'll get back in front of them as soon as we possibly can. I mean, Jeff, can you can you describe what it was like to to visit your neighbor? I was just going to say, I was going to butt in, but yeah, it's Owen sums it up really beautifully. It's a massive difference and it's weird. Um, the one time that we've played for live people and since March was uh, a neighbor just like behind my house has stage four cancer and is basically going to die. I mean, really since her daughter said, Hey, she asked me, would you come and just play a little something for her? Cause she loves music. And she had been a supporter of the seminar and had actually the, um, Aeolus Quartet stayed there, some of them at some point. Anyway, so we, I said, well, I got nothing, but I bet my quartet would be into coming over. And so it, it was one of those, the aligning of the stars, the weather was beautiful. Uh, we played outside and they had this covered deck and we were looking out at the Santa Cruz mountains and the top of Windy Hill. And we played a Haydn Quartet and, and she and Diana and her husband and a couple of friends were there. And it was just, it was so beautiful because they really, not just because the fact that this was something that she loved and she loved music, but it was just like live people sitting listening to us, and it was such a it's such a totally different experience than than trying to play a concert for a video like we did for the not to say this seventy six thing which you're about to hear is not okay, but it's really weirdly different because um, yes, you know I it's 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 happening in real time and you have you as Owen sort of mentioned the. Uh, the, the air is vibrating because people are listening and you get a sense you can actually feel when people are reacting even though they're not reacting and and it's and you know it will be done and that moment in time will never happen again for that person yeah. and it's i mean this is getting sort of bs -y, but when mm -hmm. you're playing for video you're constantly thinking well this may be one off but oh that was bad oh shoot that's going to be mm -hmm. on video mm -hmm. you know there's this constant it's not the same at all. It's the, it's not BSy at all. What you said, I think it's absolutely true. I, yeah. I totally agree with you. You know, and and you make it work. It's like you know, you play on the radio. I, I'm happy to play on the radio anytime, but it uh, always feels a little weird because you know that there are people out there, but you don't know who they are. You can't see them, and 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 yeah, and, and to that to that experience that we had play that one day. I, I remember I, I came home from rehearsal afterward, and and my wife said, "Oh, what, what did you do today? You seem." There's something different about your your sort of composure and I said, and I and I like my wide eyes said we played for people <laughs> you know I like I literally said that to because I, I didn't tell her going off to rehearsal we didn't know for sure we were going to do it it was somewhat spontaneous right mm -hmm. and I didn't say oh today we're going to get to play for some people I said oh I'm going to rehearsal we're going to you know rehearse at Jeff's place and and it was I mean I mean she's if she were here she would tell you she just saw something different in my 
in my eyes and in my in my whole sort of composure because we had had that experience. So, yeah, I mean, you play for the for the video and 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 you could do some good stuff. I think. I mean, um, hopefully, you know, we want to do good stuff. You want to still be the same players, but it's never quite the same as have even to, compared to playing on a deck behind somebody's house overlooking the mountains. I mean, with an audience of six, you know, it's 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 an audience. You're playing for for live people, so. I know there's a phenomenon and I need to look into what it's called, but it's something that we all experience, everybody, I'm sure, across humanity of this magic that happens when people come together in silence. In some places it's worship, some places it's music, some poetry in other places. And there's this magic, this force of supernatural force that ties all the people together in the room. And it does feel hollow um, in a, almost an unidentifiable way when we mm -hmm. play for an empty hall. And I don't feel like it's that they're there to listen to us. It's just that that convening, that um, tying together of mm -hmm. souls or something. That's some magic that happens when you're all all together. Um, um, I was thinking really, yeah. like, like setting up your living room for a grand dinner party of 45 people and making sure everything's perfect and the food's ready and then sitting down and eating by yourself. It just feels a little <laughs> Yeah, but, there's something missing. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but um, but there's a lot to be there's a lot to be said for this time that we have together. That's focused. That's not as fractured uh, mm -hmm. as our normal touring life um, requires. And um, we're a lot, a lot to be grateful for. Very grateful for our our home and our community, and our our job, our university that supports us and stands with us. Oh, so, that'd be lovely. Yeah. Very yeah. well, I will say like, that it was it was pretty sweet. Like the that being the show that you're going to see, that was the first time we played outside of my basement mm -hmm. in like eight months. You know, it was it was so weird to play because my basement is tremendous. I love it, but it's <laughs> a, it's a, like an anarchic chamber. It has zero reverb. It's just mm -hmm. awful sounding, um, which is great for rehearsing. But and we get into Bing Concert Hall, which is polar opposite. It's this beautiful reverberant like space so that was pretty cool to actually get and play your instrument in a space that was not my basement right it really nice. well, that sounded pretty good i think music in the morning people or or anybody that tunes in don't you think adrian it's really and this is amazing to have this talk but you know what the so so what you're saying right now in terms of the digital space you're feeling like it's it's making lemonade out of lemons right and at the same time, I, I really do mean it. When you're playing in this video we're about to see, the, the there's that kind of frisson of, of the electricity of of something live about about you that is preserved, about the quartet, yeah. the, the way that you're playing off of each other. And then, you know, I was always thinking, I was thinking that this is this is the big pervasive thing that, that COVID has done to me in terms of what this all means. And if we think about theater. And, and how many centuries that happened from, from the globe, from Shakespeare, from that time, no, no picture taken, no moving pictures, no talking pictures. And then suddenly that happened and how many people were against it? And then now movies themselves are a cinematic art that we all have, we understand the stakes, we understand the difference, we understand the dimension, whether, whether it's squished into a two dimensional confine or not, we have taken them in. There's movies that I'm sure all of us have been very moved by and we love. Do we believe that the pursuit is finished, that there isn't a way that there is a digital experience that could change our art, that it's no longer, this is stage acting, this is now De Niro acting, like how, how De Niro brought, Robert De Niro brought everybody in on, on the face and he started working really, really efficiently. He never did, stage whispers, he did a lot of restraint, that emotional quality and, and hugeness could happen from not saying something. You know what I mean? Like there, that, that you take in all of the limitations. Isn't that what, it, what this all is? The, the quartet is a limitation of four voices being able to traverse several different realities, whether they're real or not, whether they're orchestral or not, or whether they're a whisper or not. Is, is there something still left to explore? Wow, you said that so beautifully. I don't even know. I don't even know how to respond. <laughs> yeah, I want to let that let that question just kind of like that was tremendous. resonate for a little while. That was yeah. What I mean, you're you're doing it though. I feel like you're well. You more than any other quartet are are really touching on something here that has potential. 
I mean, I think we're we're seeking it, and um, you know, I will say that it for me the um, opportunity here lies more in new music and and works written specifically for you know this medium in mind. Um, you know, trying to fit square peg and round hole, I think will will always have something of a limitation. I'm not saying that you know playing Haydn on video is square peg and round hole, but there you know there is a, an experience of that type that has never been bettered. And I think, I think that um, we would be sort of poor custodians of this tradition if we didn't grapple with that or recognize that on some level that like a live concert is fundamentally the best for something like a Haydn string quartet. Um, but I think that there's, there's so much, um, there's so much room to experiment with, you know, what is the new, uh, what can this format do for new music and and what can composers who are actually writing with this the limitations in mind I call them limitations but they're it's just a different palette like you're describing the difference between you know cinema and and stage acting um, so you know we we are as active and interested as ever in in um, commissioning and working with our composer colleagues and friends who who are thinking along these lines and can kind of help us chart that path well, it's interesting. That's a great, I mean, Adrian, it's really thought provoking. So that's, um, I, I always go, I'll go back to uh, Julia Quartet and Robert Mann and the heyday of the quartet. You know, they're, they were tremendous and life changing, but on record, they were not that good. It was weird. They, and in those days, most of their great records were made before digital, which meant before editing effortlessly. Um, and so you get a sense of the, the worry about being perfect that they had, but, but live, they just let loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, it was a totally different experience. So I still think, mm -hmm. I mean, anyway, we struggle with that now. Should we do really like a live zoom thing and make it really live? Does anybody care? You know, all those questions. No, I mean, most people don't care, right? You're watching your phone. Does it matter if it's actually occurring at the moment? I don't know. It's a, it's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I can say, personally, I think something like this is a way, hopefully, to convince people listening to come to music in the morning and listen to live music when we can. Mm -hmm. That's Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. can hardly wait. Wait to have you back. We can hardly wait. Right. Well, well, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for providing this video. June and I Thanks, were having Adrian. a great time watching it. Great. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. You can't replace what we lost. It's just not possible. Suddenly, we had all this time. It was disorienting. The whole pandemic era is forcing us to rethink everything. We're left with this world that is so different. How do you bridge that gap? That's what we've been exploring. We didn't see each other in person for five months. We played for four hours the first day upon getting back. Hey, Jen. Thank you. A lot of it felt great, but something just sounded wrong. We needed to go note by note by note and kind of rebuild our group sense of intonation. There are lots of things to get used to. One is not being able to see people's facial expressions. 
staying a little farther apart does really make a difference. You have to listen a little differently. Yeah, that gets us six feet. Haydn essentially invented the string quartet, you know, back in the 18th century. This piece provides such a wide range of experiences. It allows us to explore so many possibilities as quartet players and as a group. There's a sense of it being clever music. There's a sense of it being uh, humorous music. And then there's a sense of it being emotional music at the same time. Ah, shit! You've got to be on the verge of emotionally breaking down. You want to give the impression that at those moments that you're really living that. St. Lawrence String Quartet, return to Haydn, take one.
Thank you.